Howard Thurman's life is led with such integrity and such respect for the human person that when he speaks, he speaks with deep credibility. And, um, and that I think is what stirs people. Um, and, um, that, that I think is what gives him this, um, aura of a prophet or a mystic. There is this credibility and integrity behind the words that shapes the, the live experience of hearing the sermon and changes people just is deeply affecting to people and wants and leads people to want not only to know more about Thurman, certainly that's the case, but it instills this curiosity about God and a curiosity about the human condition, wonder and delight in being a human being. He's able to do that because of his credibility. Hello and welcome to Can I Get a Witness, the podcast. This podcast is an audio companion to the book, Can I Get a Witness? 13 Peacemakers, Community Builders, and Agitators for Faith and Justice. I'm Shay Tuttle. In each episode of this podcast, I'll talk with one of our authors about the person they profiled for the book and about their writing process. Today I'm talking with Danielle McRae. Danielle McRae is Assistant Professor of Homiletics at Yale Divinity School. Her book, The Censored Pulpit, Julian of Norwich as Preacher, is forthcoming from Lexington Books Fortress Academic. Danielle, thank you so much um, for talking to me about Howard Thurman and for being a part of this project. I really appreciate um, getting to have a conversation with you. So thanks. Sure. So could you start out um, by giving just a kind of summary, a brief summary of Howard Thurman's significance for people who may not be familiar with his work. He was a, just a gem of a person, an amazing figure, both in the way he narrates the importance of spiritual life and in the way his, his focus on inner life connects with this, lo- this, lar- this attention to larger movements, particularly the civil rights movement movements for peace, efforts for justice. So there's this, when I think of Howard Thurman, I think of someone who is focused on inner and outer and is looking for peace that manifests both individually within the soul and externally within the cosmos. You know, I kind of think of my chapter of, on him as like a watercolor portrait of him because there's there's so many dimensions of his life and so many areas where he makes a huge impact. You know, he's especially known for his influence on Martin Luther King Jr. and his interactions with Mahatma Gandhi. But as a teacher, as a pastor, as a writer and a religious philosopher, he was he was really just birthing peace into the world in so many different ways. He wrote so much, you know, he had over 20 books. So there's just a lot of material to to sort through, but I think of him as a, a peacemaker and a, a justice maker. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the the sort of challenge you're referring to of figuring out what to write. I mean, I think Thurman in the book is one of the more, um, he's one of the better known characters in the book. I think we have some people who no one's ever heard of. And then Thurman is somebody who's a little more well known and and has been written about a lot. But you take this very specific focus on his tenderness. Can you talk a little bit about what drew you to writing about that in particular? Why Why that focus? Well, you know, I think in the world right now, there's this desperate need for tenderness and gentleness. And, you know, I think in the political discourse, but also 
in the way human beings are treating one another right now, there's this coldness and violence that seems to be just raining on us. And I think there are many virtues that I could draw on to talk about Thurman. I mean, he's incredibly patient. He has so much clarity, clarity about what matters and what doesn't matter. He has tremendous perspective and consciousness of the spiritual realm. He has endurance. Uh, there just there are many character qualities to draw upon, but his tenderness is it's just it's so palpable in studying his life. It stands out as as a core aspect of his humanity that he holds on to. I mean, he guards it and cherishes it. And I think people who study his life often find themselves valuing their own tenderness and wanting to nurture it in the world as well. Hmm. That's lovely. So I'd love to get into his um, story. And I feel like you bring him to life so beautifully on the page. Would you mind reading that opening excerpt from your chapter, the, the sort of opening narrative? Sure. He was always so tender, always knew the right thing to say in the face of their insults. He kept a good quip ready, not a scathing one, but one that would hold a mirror up to them. But not this time. This time, all he had was a stream of expletives. When the stream slowed, he would have space for a wordless prayer and room for silence to fill his mind but only in fits and starts. Still a student at Colgate Rochester Seminary at the time, Howard Thurman had been invited to speak at a white church that Sunday night, and the evening began with a dinner at a church member's home, a feat in itself in Rochester in 1927, a Ku Klux Klan haven. Thurman knew they wanted him to be relaxed and happy, grateful for the opportunity to sup with them. As soon as he took off his coat, he befriended the family's five-year-old daughter. A fast friend, she insisted on sitting next to him at the table. It was one of those courteous meals with lots of smiling and giggling. The mood was so light that he almost didn't believe it when he heard it. The child's faint whisper, stop, nigger, stop. He thought he must have been mistaken. The conversation sparked up again, but beneath the laughter and the clink of forks on porcelain, the whisper broke in again. Stop, nigger, stop. He was sure of it this time. Under the hum of the conversation, he could hear the child's mother. Why don't you take him out into the kitchen and be sure to close the door so he can't come in and bother us? At that, the little girl reached under the table, picked up a large black cat, and bounced off to the kitchen. The glad table carried on, clueless. If Christian faith forced him to swallow his horror along with the meal, it was toxic. If faith demanded that he speak out, but gently and apologetically or pedagogically, so as to preserve the dignity and the feelings of his hosts, then that faith was a tendril of white supremacy. He had no use for a faith that denied him rage in a moment like this one. What other man would have let his guard down? What other black man would have even come to dinner at a white stranger's house, let alone with any expectation of friendship? But Howard had a softness that would not stay tucked away. Its continuous unfurling was a radical thing in a world where only the numb survived. Sometimes his tenderness opened doors to genuine conversation, and other times it left him vulnerable to eating with white folks and their nigger cats. The worst thing about their sick mix of scorn and affection for blackness was how familiar it was. Familiar, that is, in the way one's own vomit is familiar. He was glad to rise 
and walk away from that table. That Howard became so tender in the first place is a miracle. There were many reasons to let calluses grow on his soul and protect himself from the stoniness of life. And there was every reason to believe tenderness was a virtue reserved for elves or fairies or other creatures with recourse to a more enchanted world. Yet throughout his life, Howard intentionally claimed his tenderness. With this central piece of his humanity intact, he became a path-breaking teacher of spiritual life. Thank you so much. It is... It's such a compelling story anyway, but your telling of it is beautiful. And then your reading of it, just, I could listen to you read all day. It's so beautiful. So thank you. Um, so where do you think Howard's tenderness came from? Do you think it was sort of just a part of him? It's who he was going to be. Were there things that cultivated that? Where do you think, how do you read that in him? Where did that begin? Yeah, so I do think there was, a, there's a, you know, some of this is innate. He was a gentle soul, and I think there are probably many gentle souls, and it's, you know, life, the situations of our lives harden us and estrange us from that tenderness, make us see it as a vulnerability or something that we need to be trained out of, which is it's actually quite tragic. But in his case, I think he had this essential gentleness that was nurtured by his mother and grandmother. And I think that was deepened when he started caring, caring for his uh, baby sister, Madeline, and was, um, was really providing child care for several years. And I think he learned to 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 see this to see tenderness as a virtue and not something that he needed to hide or um or bury so yeah 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 well and i think your your um the passage that you read also it really names how the sort of cost of that of that being a vulnerability but that he that you name that he intentionally claimed it it's um, there's a real strength in that that's really compelling, I think. So you also, I think that that section also illustrates how tenderness for Howard sometimes, it coexisted with rage. Um, and I'm wondering what you make of, of that coexistence. You know, I think we certainly live in a time where there's a lot of rage, meant much of it, you know, important rage as his was. Um, how do you think Thurman can show us how rage and tenderness um, coexist, or can or should, you know, coexist? Well, I think part of um, what I'm tapping into when I talk about his tenderness is his being in touch with his own emotional life and valuing his own humanity. And that involves both valuing his own strengths and valuing the vulnerability that comes with simply being a creature on the planet. When he's in spaces or witnesses events where that human tenderness is under attack, the anger is an appropriate response to that. I think in many cases, people think of, and I think I did for for many years, think of tenderness as mere softness or as passivity, really. Tenderness as the same as docility. And that's not the case for him. The tenderness is a vibrant thing within him, a vibrant aspect of his personality. It's not uh, incompatible with anger. No, No more incompatible with anger than it is sorrow. In fact, I think the, the tenderness probably gave him more space to interrogate his own rage and hold on to it instead of um, sort of rushing through it and seeing it as an emotion that has little spiritual value. I should say spiritual value 
or social value, because I think it has both. And he recognized he recognized the the many gifts within rage. Hmm. So you write um, in in your discussion of Howard's childhood, you write about it as a childhood among the trees. And you have this line that's so lovely that the trees could listen to a black boy's fears and dreams without wincing. What brought you into this part of Howard's story? Well, you know, I think that he had such a respect for the life of children, for the interior world of children, and is aware of how much of his own formation was shaped in his childhood. And I, it was clear to me as I read his autobiography and studied other resources that he was a child who needed to be heard. I think that's true of so many children who need who need a witness to um, their stories, their questions, their pain. And he got that witness, I mean, to some extent, well, to a large extent through his grandmother and mother and father and the, the actual human beings in his life. But he really got this witness in the live oak that was, you know, in the yard near his house. And there was something about the, the companionship with that tree that just shaped him in a, in a deep way. The tree was really a witness for him. And he was able to find in the tree a listening ear um, in the ways that, you know, I think I'm trying to paraphrase his own language, but he was really seeing that tree as one who is um, responding to the beauty of creation and listening to to God's work in the world. The tree is a kind of silent witness. But he found in the tree the ear that he needed and a vision of sort of being solid and strong and yet tender, you know, in mm-hmm. the face of all that's going on in the world. While I didn't write about it, I was really struck by, you know, this is Florida, right? And here, here is a young black boy who is connecting in a deep way to trees at a time when lynching is prevalent. And what a stark contrast to some of the imagery that we see of um, early 20th century African-American life, like the connection between black masculinity and trees is usually one, it's, it's a horror, it's a connection of horror. It's a, the sort of automatic picture is one of terror because of the stories and the, the images that circulate and because of the, the tragedy of white supremacy and how it manifests in different parts of the country. But I think um, Howard Thurman, you know, showing this, this, this sort of very natural, and of course this picture would exist, is, is sort of what I thought in, you know, revisiting this. Of course there, were, there was this affinity, but it is, it's a picture that's overshadowed by by the reality of lynching. So I wanted to to shine a light on how beautiful this connection was and how how it, it shaped him over the arc of his life as a whole. Mm-hmm. Have you had a chance to see the live oak in person? I have not seen it in person. I have only seen, um, I, I think I may have mentioned to you that I have had some conversation and connected with some people who are at his family home in uh, Daytona. And there was a photographer who was kind enough to take some pictures of the live oak for me so that I could, um, could see it. And I have to say, you know, there are pictures, there's a picture of the live oak in his autobiography, um, but that was taken many, many years ago. And this, these more recent pictures, of, it was just such a delight to see it because it's still thriving. Yeah. 
and it's beautiful and yeah it was it was wonderful so i hope to to see it in person one day <laughs> yeah yeah i imagine it would be so powerful to be there but it sounds like that even it even comes through in the photos for you it does spend time yeah. with them and yeah that's really neat so you talk in your chapter about how um you sort of make reference to the fact that over the course of his life Howard's relationship to religious belief and to church went through some shifts. Um, you mentioned that he moved away from church after his um, after his father's death, and then that later, of course, he returned. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about the experiences that moved him away and then back into sort of religious belief and practice? I think that the sort of singular event that drew him that led him out of church was his experience at his father's funeral and witnessing the difficulty his grandmother had in actually getting the funeral to take place in a church at all um and so he sees um he has this window into black church as this place of estrangement where there are limits to who's welcome and the terms of being welcome and part of the community are limiting. And they uh, essentially don't make space for the kind of spiritual experience that Saul Thurman has. And because of his profound connection to his father, that was deeply alienating. It's, it takes a long time for him to become open to church again. He actually has a similar experience that I don't write about uh, later. He's, I guess, a teenager at the time when he is exploring ministry and comes to the church, presents himself, and finds that the ways that he is talking about his 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 the ways that he's narrating his own faith, they just don't register with the church mm -hmm. folk. You know, it seems that they are wanting, you know, there's certain um, catchphrases almost that they want to hear. There's certain ways that they want to hear him talk about faith, and he is so rooted in his own experience and his need for authenticity that he can't. He can't use their language. He has his own, and it creates this tension. And then even later on, um, there are periods when his own ways of praying and being present during times of worship create a hindrance for other people who are sort of moving through the motions. So it's an ongoing tension, but he has this deep, an ongoing experience of of Jesus and um, feels this sense of hope and clarity in reading and studying the teachings of Jesus that, you know, provides a well within him. You know, the spirituals were, I mean, they were like manna for him, sort of tapping into the movement of the spirit within the souls for people who were enslaved, who were singing these songs, but as they are claimed by subsequent generations, there's this deep sense of the spirit's work that motivates him and makes him feel connected to not only the other people who are present singing with him, but connects him to this long legacy of people who experiences are articulated in the spiritual. So that's another experience that really grounds him, grounds him spiritually and also connects him to the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting. It feels like there's this, in talking with you, there's this sort of recurrence of this idea of, um, well, in, in your language from that opening excerpt, the kind of miracles <laughs> in his life, you know, there's a sort of miracle of tenderness. And then there's this sort of miracle of the, the tree, you know, this relationship with the tree, the, these things that seem to be um, like they should be so difficult or impossible. And then 
the, just the fact that he had these really kind of negative experiences with the church and then ends up in ministry. It, it just anyway, it's just really it's really interesting and seems to go to that kind of strength of the of the live oak, you know, this that you were that you were articulating of this, you know, this rootedness and this strength and also this tenderness and receptivity to what's around. Anyway, it's it's really it's neat. I'm talking to you, it feels like it's just drawing that line in some ways. Howard had these experiences of the divine that took place outside of ecclesial settings. And I think that, so one of them that he writes about, um, he's at a railroad station going to school and finds that he doesn't have enough money. And um, a stranger gives him the money that he needs to take his trip. And he is ever grateful for this, but this is really one of the kind of core miracles of his life is that suddenly in this unexpected place, he, he finds what he needs. And I think that's something that happens repeatedly in his life in these unexpected places and times. He has these miraculous experiences and gets what he needs, whether it's, you know, the live oak or this train station or, you know, other times when the divine breaks in for him and his faith just gets deeper because of these experiences. So you referenced his mother and grandmother, um, and also, is it a younger sister that he's caring for? Uh, yeah, so he has an older sister, Henrietta, but also a younger sister, Madeline, who he's, he really is her nurse, essentially. <laughs> okay, yeah. It just, it seems like, and I think there's a reference in your chapter two to a, a, a church leader who's a woman. It seems like he has so many important women in his life. Is that a kind of theme for him? And, and if so, how do you think that shaped who he was? It is, you know, and I, um, it was something that I noticed when, when writing this piece. I mean, so even his, his life with his wife, Sue, and his two daughters, it's just striking that he is um, consistently like living within these circles of women. Mm -hmm. It's the case in his household as an adult. It's also the case in his household as a child. Now, his mother remarries a couple of times, but it's consistently he's living with, with a group of women. And even when, with the uh, Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples, you know, women were instrumental in bringing that church to life. So I do think that he has these, um, he's formed by women. He experiences women's leadership. He gets a sense of how women move through the world. I think he's conscious of this and conscious of the gifts that these different women in, in his life bring. So I do think it's a, it's a profound influence and uh, shapes the man he becomes. So later in your piece, you write, um, there's a sentence that says, he preached with such authority that some of his listeners experienced him as a mystic or a prophet. And I found this really interesting in a in a in an essay focused on tenderness to talk about authority. Um, I think particularly in a time when um, culturally we associate authority with being loud or being a bully. Right. <laughs> um, and so I'm wondering, in thinking about Howard Thurman, what do you think tenderness has to do with authority? I think that you're right that in many ways, in preaching in particular, when we think about authority, we're talking about what we're often thinking about is control and manipulation and power over, or sometimes charisma, which can, can work in some ways that are life-giving, but also often works in ways that are self aggrandizing. I think what we see in Howard Thurman is something Letty Russell describes as the authority of purpose. It's not an authority that is, that is trying to usurp another person's agency or freedom of thought. I think Christine Smith says that instead of thinking about preaching 
authority, we ought to think about preaching credibility, right? What gives, what gives meaning and a quality of credibility to what is being said? And Howard Thurman's life is led with such integrity and such respect for the human person that when he speaks, he speaks with deep credibility. And that, I think, is what stirs people. And that, I think, is what gives him this aura of a prophet or a mystic. There is this credibility and integrity behind the words that shapes the, the live experience of hearing the sermon and changes people, just is deeply affecting to people. And wants and leads people to want not only to know more about Thurman, certainly that's the case, but it instills this curiosity about God and a curiosity about the human condition, wonder and delight in being a human being. He's able to do that because of his credibility. That's how I see tenderness and authority coming together for him. He never gets into talking down to the people who are listening, but he has this he has this awe for how God is manifest in each one of them. Yeah, you you call Howard a pastor at heart. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I read that, I was thinking about how you have done chaplaincy work. You teach at a divinity school. You, you know, teach in homiletics. And um, I'm wondering how for you, you know, learning about Thurman as a pastor, how is that connected with your own sort of pastoral sensibilities? I'm very conscious of my own identity as a layperson, as one who teaches homiletics, <laughs> because it's sort of, um, in some ways, it makes me kind of a fish out of water. But in my experience with chaplaincy, I was always aware that what really mattered was how present I can be to the people I'm standing with, you know, whether I'm actually in a hospital or at a funeral or at a sick person's home, what mattered was how present can I be to the people who are here and how can I be a witness, witness to their pain, but also witness to God's grace. And I think that Howard Thurman was able to hold these dimensions together in ways that are just sort of indescribable. You know, he was so present so present to other people and a conduit for grace and light. It was almost automatic for him after a time. I think studying him has deepened my appreciation for the different ways that people pastor. I think that studying Howard Thurman has kept me, it's helped me not focus so much on, you know, being the official pastor in a church, right? or um, thinking of pastoring in solely in ecclesial terms, but thinking of it as a verb, right? It's about the kind of presence one can offer to other people. And I think it's rare that we offer that to one another, but a beautiful thing when it happens. Yeah. So you have used the word witness multiple times in this in this conversation, talking about, you know, uh, Howard as a child needing a sort of witness and the, the tree providing that. And then um, in, the, in a pastoral role, functioning as a witness to, to where people are in their pain or their um, wherever they may be in their lives. I'm wondering about, I think coming into this book, um, there was so much of a question of like, what does it mean to be a witness? And, you know, in some ways, as we've collected these stories, we found all of these different testaments to what that can look like. When you think about Howard Thurman, how do you think that he sort of illuminates what it means to be a witness? So I think on a fundamental level, Howard Thurman is a witness in that he sees He's like a seer, you know, Uh, I don't think I ever use that term in my chapter, but I do see him as a seer in many respects. He's able to look at, look into suffering without looking away. 
And I think there's a dimension of being a witness, a particularly a Christian witness, that requires not turning away, not turning one's gaze from individual human suffering or from the deep waves, the overwhelming waves of suffering and violence. I see us as within a series of waves of violence and suffering right now in human history. And so I think the big piece of his witness is is seeing, not turning away, and making space for others to share their experiences. There were these moments when his grandmother would really just sort of enter into this mode of reflection. You know, he could just see the pain on her face and he could intuit just from seeing his grandmother that she was reflecting on her life as an enslaved person. He could just intuit this. And I think his ability to to see this without her explaining to him or her having to leave the room or, you know, her having to make any sort of outward gesture. His ability to intuit is a sign of just how much of a witness he is to this, you know, his ability to actually see her, you know, not just see her body, but to actually see who she was and to see her emotional life unfold. He was a witness to that. Because he's a witness to the the deep pain that she suffered, he is also committed to human freedom. And that deep commitment to human freedom is manifest when he is preaching and teaching and writing. So I think the I think that his ability to witness in the typical ways that we think of it in terms of through speech and through protest is informed by the suffering that he has actually seen and made space for. The two go hand in hand. Yeah. How do you think you've been changed by spending so much time with Howard Thurman? So there's a woman named Meryl Carrington, who would talk about Evelyn Underhill as a kind of inner companion. That's her language. She said that, you know, in studying Evelyn Underhill, Underhill became an inner companion for her. And I think I'd say the same is true for me when it comes to Howard Thurman. I think of him as a kind of inner companion. You know, I think he's Change the landscape of my inner life and made me into just tuned me into a different level of awareness. And I think it's freed me up in a lot of ways. And so it's been a, it's been an incredible gift to, to sit with his story for so long and to listen to his voice, to read his work to listen to other people who knew him and who've studied his work, reflect on his impact. I mean, you know, I leave this project with an amazing sense of the kind of human being he was, just amazed by him as a human being, but amazed by what one life can achieve in bringing a picture of wholeness and peace into the world. Yeah, it's lovely. I I feel like I get that sense from your chapter and from talking to you also that you have, that you've, you've really sort of internalized his presence in this very deep way. And that's, um, uh, yeah, there's just something about that that's really, um, that's really powerful even, well, to witness, right? (laughs) Um, I think, that can be, I th- there are lots of ways that I think people's stories can be powerful, but I feel like that's just a really, uh, it's a really compelling one. Danielle, it's been so great to talk to you. I, I so appreciate your time and your um, thought and your sharing Howard Thurman with us. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jay. It's been an honor to do it. 
Can I Get a Witness, the podcast, is a production of the Project on Lived Theology at the University of Virginia, a research initiative whose mission is to study the social consequences of theological ideas for the sake of a more just and compassionate world. To learn more about lived theology, visit livedtheology.org or find us on social media. This podcast is produced, edited, and engineered by Jessica Seibert and written, edited, and hosted by me, Shay Tuttle. Original music is by Drew Wilson. Special thanks to project director Charles Marsh. The book, Can I Get a Witness? 13 Peacemakers, Community Builders, and Agitators for Faith and Justice is edited by Charles Marsh, Shay Tuttle, and Daniel P. Rhodes. It's published by Erdman's Publishing Company and is available now in all your favorite formats from all your favorite booksellers. Thank you for listening to Can I Get a Witness? The podcast. Thank you.